guest is the Brit Pack actor who rose to stardom from humble beginnings in a small Lancashire town. From his role as a drug fueled space cadet in Human Traffic to playing New Order frontman Bernard Sumner, music has always played a big part in his life. Back from his recent stint on Mars, today the Orange playlist welcomes the very down to earth John Sim. <laughs> We were living in a dodgy hotel, nearly got burnt down about four times. What's cool about not turning up to gigs and being a, a smackhead? It was just a fantastic time, I just had a lot of fun. John, welcome to the Orange Playlist. Thank you. Uh, now, you've just finished Life on Mars. We've just seen that on the television, hugely successful. It was all about the 70s. Now, what were your memories of the 70s? The thing I remember most about the 70s is 77. God save the queen, the fascist regime. I remember the sex was really vividly, um, being on TV and just arriving. And uh, it was the ju Silver Jubilee. Yes. And it was really hot summer. I remember that, and I also remember Elvis dying that year as well. Now I'm going to take you further back into your childhood. Where did you grow up? I went to school in a place called Nelson near Burnley in Lancashire. It was in the days when you know you could play out and um, everybody left, left the doors unlocked and all that. You know, it's yeah. all, it, was all, it was all very nice. I was obsessed with Elvis when I was a kid. I was really? really little, yeah. And everybody else was into Adam and the Ants and all that and the jam and and I was really into Elvis. So I used to get the, the, the rip taken out of me quite a bit. What was it about Elvis that sort of like captured your imagination as a boy? I guess I just sort of fell in love with him as, a, as an icon, you know? Mm. I, I learnt his army serial number off by heart. <laughs> there was a few of us who used to go down the youth club and, uh, and uh, do Elvis dances. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really, I'm joking. <laughs> you still did. <laughs> if I hadn't have laughed, you would have carried that on. <laughs> yeah, we did. Who were your teenage heroes then, musically? I got into um, rock, like ACDC. I was really I into all that. that. I, did I, that. I was well into that for a long time. I remember there was a babysitter and he brought round, um, when I was listening to nothing but Elvis and the Beatles, he brought round uh, Let There Be Rock, the ACDC album. It literally blew my mind and changed my life overnight. And I, I think I took the next day off school and I, I played it to death. So I was, I was well into that. And that was the first gig I ever went to. You also had a bit of brush with music yourself because you used to play in working men's clubs, yeah, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, my dad's a club artist and he was pretty good and he'd done it all his life, you know, and, and that's, I was sort of, I was brought up on all that. And uh, when I was about 11, I started doing it with him. Were you not scared? Yeah, I was petrified. But when I got a little bit older, I think about 13, 12, 13, he taught me the guitar. And um, after he taught me the guitar, that was it. We were a double act, and we were a double act for quite a few years until I was about well, 16, 17. What were you called, your double act? We were called Us Two, US Two. We played a local working men's club, I can't remember what it was, but in the paper the week before, it said um, Friday, U2. And I was like, oh man, Dad, we've got to ring, ring the paper, tell them they've made a massive mistake because they're going to think it's like an underground gig or something. And he was like, Who's you too? Nobody at school knew I did this. I did this for years and years and nobody knew. I just disappeared at weekends. Um, and we turned up at the club and it was packed. And there were people I knew from school in the audience, you know, the U2 t-shirt. And it was, it was just really embarrassing. <laughs> it was fine by the end of it, but I think that was the moment that I decided, I thought, well, maybe I'll be an actor. What was it that made you sort of like think, acting's for me? I remember seeing Elvis in King Creole when he sang Trouble. That sort of hit a chord to me. But it was it was it was James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause. I remember seeing that, and overnight I just thought, Wow, I, I want to do that. I think the next day I went up to the drama teacher at school, who's called Brian Wellock. I just said, oh, I saw James Dean last night, and I really liked it. And I, it was really good. And I didn't know, I didn't know what I was trying to say to him, but he must have seen something. He said, Well, why don't you just come to one of the classes? So I gave up a football practice or something. I went to the class, and I just thought, it, I just thought it was really easy. I'm going to take you into your past track now, John. 
What is your past track and why have you gone for it, please? Um, it's Waterfall by the Stone Roses. It's the whole album, really. I was just picking one of the songs from the album. It could have been any of them. I mean, the whole album just, uh, just totally changed everything that I think about music overnight. It was just, it just blew me away. Incredibly influential, the Stone Roses. I mean, do you think they changed the face of music? Yeah, well, they certainly did in my little world, mm. um, and uh, everyone around me. Yeah, definitely, they they blew it out of the water, didn't they? I always had total belief that I'd, I'd, I'd do something. We were living in a dodgy hotel that I think nearly got burnt down about four times. <laughs> You had your big breaks in the 90s. Yeah. Um, there was human traffic, there was the lakes. Um, like human traffic, um, tell me a little bit about it. It was yeah. difficult sort of doing all the, uh, the, the scenes where we're, we're, we're off it in the clubs. Because, you know, you'd be filming it at like 8 o'clock in the morning, so we'd have like contact lenses on to make our pupils big. And so it looked like, like you were looking through an eclipse. How much research do you take on when you take a part on like that? Do you have to sort of like get yourself involved in certain lifestyles to, uh, do, you see, do you see where I've gone? <laughs> I'm going I'm now, yeah. basically asking you if you took a lot of drugs. Put it this way, for human traffic I really didn't need to do much because I spent like most of the time up until then doing research for that film, uh, unawares <laughs> as I was that it was going to come up. So when we went into the, um, into the audition, he basically just asked him, look, have you ever taken an E? And if you said no, then it was like, well, I can't really, you can't really pretend, you know, you, you're going to have to take one or whatever. But luckily, we were all fine. Everything took off for me the night. It was just a fantastic time. I just had a lot of fun. Because I'm into, so into music, I just used it to sort of get into loads of gigs and met my heroes. What was just one of your best gigs in the 90s? I remember seeing Oasis at the Borderline. Um, in front of about 100 people mm. and it was for the video of um, cigarettes and alcohol and I'm actually right at the front and I'm in that video <laughs> it was a brief flash but we're in it sort of dancing in slow motion they did the video and then played for about two and a half hours until they fell over drunk you know and that was a fantastic gig the Oasis were absolutely incredible weren't they they, yeah. ca they seemed to capture that 90s that first album it's a genuine genuine classic and um, and you know unfortunately for them they'll never reach that again like you know no band ever does no. a bit probably like the Arctic Monkeys now you know that is a genuine classic album I mean it's not it's not for me and you because we're too old yeah <laughs> but, that's the thing. but definitely maybe was and for me Columbia the song Columbia from definitely maybe it's one of I think it's one of the finest songs I've ever heard 